Let's begin by talking about drugs used to treat diabetes. The treatment strategy differs depending on the type of diabetes you are treating, with a caveat that almost all diabetics will eventually require insulin. In type 1 diabetes, patients are encouraged to maintain a low carbohydrate diet and are prescribed insulin to replace the insulin that is no longer produced by the pancreas. In contrast, in type 2 diabetes, diet and exercise to decrease weight are often the first-line recommendations. If this fails, patients will be started on oral agents, and then in the case that these fail, insulin is added. Lastly, in gestational diabetes, like type 2, diet and exercise must be encouraged. However, unlike type 2, oral agents are not used during pregnancy, as insulin is a preferred agent to control hyperglycemia. Let's start by reviewing the different types of injectable insulin patients may use. As you can see from the graph and the table on this slide, there are four categories of insulin which are organized by onset and duration of action. Do you remember which three rapid-acting insulin formulations are available? Lispro, Aspart, and Glulysine. The way I remember these drugs is by using the mnemonic LAG since they are fast acting and these do not lag. Usually these are taken right before meals. Regular insulin, shown in green on the graph, is fairly rapid acting, though not as quick as the previous three. It tends to last longer as well. The mainstay intermediate acting insulin is shown in yellow and is NPH, or neutral protamine hegedorn. Lastly, the two long-acting insulins, their effects shown in orange on the graph, are glargine and detamir. There are several different classes of medications for type 2 diabetes. We will review this by going through this table. The first class of oral hypoglycemics is the biguanides, in which metformin is the only drug. Metformin activates AMP-activated protein kinase, or AMPK by elevating cytosolic AMP levels. AMPK is an enzyme which has important roles in insulin signaling and metabolism. The downstream effects of this is decreasing gluconeogenesis, increasing glycolysis, and increasing peripheral glucose uptake, which are all things we want to happen in the setting of diabetes mellitus. The major side effect to be aware of is lactic acidosis. Therefore, this drug is contraindicated in renal failure. Importantly, metformin does not require beta cell function for efficacy, so it can be used in type 1 diabetics in addition to being first-line therapy in type 2 diabetics. The most common side effect, however, of metformin is GI upset. The next class of oral hypoglycemics is the sulfonylureas. Sulfonylureas act on the beta cells of the pancreas to stimulate insulin release. The idea behind this is that you can increase the output of endogenous insulin instead of having the patient take regular shots of insulin. The mechanism involves closing potassium channels in beta cells, which causes the membrane to depolarize and opens voltage-gated sensitive calcium channels. The influx of calcium ions triggers exocytosis of insulin granules, hence insulin release. Sulfonylureas also contain sulfur groups. Therefore, if you have a patient with a sulfur allergy, you'll need to avoid these drugs. There are two generations of these drugs. The first is rarely used today. The first generation includes tolbutamide, tolazamide, and chlorpropramide. The mainstay thing you need to know about these drugs is they are associated with disulfiram-like reactions. Meaning, if you take these drugs with alcohol, you can have headaches, nausea, and vomiting. Of note, chlorpromide is associated with SIADH. Second generation sulfonylureas include gliberide, lamipiride, and glipizide. Because sulfonylureas act to increase the release of insulin, the major side effect is hypoglycemia, and this risk is increased in patients with renal failure. 
Now we mentioned that these drugs are not to be used in people with sulfur allergies, but there is another option. We have non-sulfonylurea secretagogues, meaning that they act in the same manner as the ones described above, but they do not have a sulfur group. These are the metaglitinides and include repaglinide and nataglinide. The thiazolidine dions, which include pioglitazone and rosaglitazone, act to increase insulin sensitivity in peripheral tissues by binding to the PPAR gamma nuclear transcription regulator. Major side effects of these drugs include weight gain, edema, and hepatotoxicity, and they are contraindicated in patients with heart failure. The alpha-glucosidase inhibitors such as acarbose and miglitol are taken at the beginning of meals, and they act by blocking the alpha-glucosidase enzyme on the intestinal brush border. This prevents hydrolysis of dietary carbohydrates and minimizes the amount of sugar that actually gets absorbed by the stomach. However, with this leftover sugar in the colon, which is not absorbed, the bacteria are happy to eat it up, and this leads to the side effect of bloating and gas. In addition, since sugar can act as an osmotic agent, these patients may also have diarrhea as a side effect. Uncommonly, one can also see hypoglycemia. The next drug I'll mention here is actually injected. Premlinotide is an analog of the protein amylin, which is normally secreted along with insulin by beta cells. The main function of premlinotide is to decrease glucagon secretion, and in this way, it can delay gastric emptying. Its side effects include hypoglycemia, nausea, and diarrhea. Glucagon-like protein 1 analogs such as exenatide and liraglutide act to boost insulin release and reduce glucagon release. Occasionally these patients may develop pancreatitis. The last group of medications are the dipeptidyl peptidase 4 or DPP4 inhibitors. DPP4 is an enzyme that inactivates GLP-1. Therefore, DPP4 inhibitors will act to block the inactivation of GLP-1, resulting in the same effects as the GLP-1 analogs, as described earlier. The DPP4 inhibitors include limagliptin, saxagliptin, and cytogliptin. So, just like GLP-1 analogs, DPP4 inhibitors affect the pancreas by increasing insulin secretion.